Hello, my name is Lewis Mitchell and I'm a student at the School of the Earth and Environment at the University of Leeds here in the UK. Today we're going to be talking about something that affects millions of people around the world. Some of you may have even experienced them yourselves. So if you can guess what it is from this quote from the famous naturalist and geologist Charles Darwin whilst he was in Chile in 1835. I was on the shore lying down in the woods to rest myself. It came on suddenly and lasted two minutes but appeared much longer. There was no difficulty in standing upright, but the motion made me feel giddy. I can compare it to skating on very thin ice. What do you think? If you said earthquakes, you'd be correct. Earthquakes can come on suddenly, last a short period of time, and can make it difficult to stand and disorientate you. Earthquakes are kind of like a, a water droplet suspended in a pool of water. We can demonstrate this with a wet paper towel and a glass. So the droplet grows in size above the pool of water and eventually becomes heavy enough to, uh, to overcome the forces suspending it. It suddenly falls and changes the surface of the water below. The energy it propagates outwards as ripples. These ripples can move the nearby water. Now what if I told you that the energy produced from an earthquake can cause severe shaking that results in the destruction of houses, roads, bridges, hospitals? Wouldn't you want to know when it, this energy is going to be released and what it, you can do to minimise the impacts on people and infrastructure? Well, that's what we're going to do in this lesson. But first, it's important that you recognise some of these key terms. Friction, elasticity, plate tectonics, plate boundaries and faults. Take a minute now to go through these terms with your teacher and then take a look at this map showing the distribution of earthquakes around the world. Are earthquakes randomly distributed? Or are the places that earthquakes tend to cluster around? Can you find where you are on the map? And if so, are there any earthquakes near where you live? Have you experienced an earthquake before? How did it feel and what did you do? Take a few minutes now to go through these with your teacher and then we'll return shortly. Welcome back. Now that you've had a chance to recall these key terms and have a look at the distribution of earthquakes globally, let's have a look at how you got on. So as you may have noticed, earthquakes aren't distributed randomly. Most earthquakes tend to occur near plate boundaries. These are the regions where tectonic plates meet. Sometimes you may experience earthquakes if you're living close to a plate boundary. But why and how do earthquakes happen near plate boundaries? What's going on there that makes them so prone to earthquakes? And is it possible to tell exactly when and where earthquakes might happen? You'll answer all these questions for yourself soon. You'll do this by building and operating a model of a fault system, or as we like to call it, an earthquake machine. But first, remember what a fault is. A fault is a fracture in a plate along which movement can occur. These fractures tend to occur near plate boundaries. Now, let's have a think about a model. An example of a model would be a globe. It represents our Earth. It's a model of our planet. Do you think it's a good model of our planet? It does certainly have some advantages. So, it takes an incredibly large and complex system that you'd only be able to observe from space and allows us to view it here in this room. We can also do tests on the models. We can test how far the United States is from the Sahara Desert. It does also have some disadvantages though. So the model loses a lot of detail of our Earth. There are no mountains or hills. And the sea is not a liquid, it's just painted on. It's also not entirely accurate. So our Earth isn't truly spherical, whereas this model is. Now let's gather up some of the materials that we're going to need to build our model. You'll need a piece of string with a rubber band attached to the end. A tape measure, two wooden blocks, both with eye screws attached at the end, and one with a piece of sandpaper glued to the bottom. And finally, a sanding belt. Now to set the model up, we'll secure the sanding belt to the table using some blue tack or stick sticky tape. Then take the block with the sandpaper attached at the bottom and mount it at one end of the sanding belt. Next, take the other block and mount it so that the eye screw is perpendicular to the sanding belt. Take the piece of string and make sure that it's tied to the rubber band like so and then thread it through the first eye screw and attach it to the end of the other one there. Now to operate the setup, simply pull on the string like so and you're ready to go. But before we operate the setup, we're going to ask you to make a few predictions. Now think of these questions. What's going to happen when you pull the string? Why is the system going to behave like this? Think about the energy flow through the system. And can you describe this? Where is the energy going in and coming out? 
after you've had a chance to discuss your predictions and why they're going to occur, run the setup and then compare the actual behaviour to your predictions. We'll come back shortly to see how you got on. Welcome back, let's see how you got on. So as you pull smoothly and steadily on the string, you may notice that the block doesn't initially move, although the elastic band stretches. This is because the complex and irregular surface of the sandpaper and the sanding belt are locked together, preventing the block from moving. The force that prevents the block is called friction. Friction occurs between two touching surfaces and is the force that slows things down or makes things hard to move. Without friction, matches wouldn't lie. The reason that they do is because as you run the match over the box, the overcoming the friction between the two creates heat, causing the match to ignite. Now back to our model. So as you continue to pull on the string, you'll notice that the elastic band stretches more. And it, eventually, this causes the block to suddenly move. The reason that the block moves is because the pulling force overcomes the frictional force that holds it in one place. So overall, the smooth and steady pulling of the string does not lead to, predictable movement, to a predictable movement of the block. The block moves every now and then an invariable amount. So how did you get on with, the, with describing the energy flow through the system? As you pull the string, you're inputting energy into the system. This energy is then transferred and stored in the elastic band as it stretches. It's stored there as elastic energy. Eventually, the energy is released in the form of the block moving forwards. Now you may ask yourself, what has this got to do with earthquakes? Good question. Take a minute now to discuss what each of the components represents in a real fault system. So what does the block represent? What does the two sandpaper surfaces represent? The, piece of the steady pulling of the string and the elastic band. And finally, what does the sudden movement of the block represent? Can this movement be predicted? Discuss these next questions now and we'll return shortly to see how well you did. Welcome back, so let's go over your answers. The wood block with sandpaper represents the side of a fault and the irregular surface that it has. The other side is represented by the sanding belt. The pull of the string represents the slow and steady pull, it's the slow and steady motion of tectonic plates, otherwise known as tectonic motion. The elastic band represents the elastic nature of the material around the fault that deforms as movement occurs. And the movement of the block itself, well that represents an earthquake. Now, let's put all of these things together. So as you pull on the string, initially you'll notice that the block doesn't move because of the two rough sandpaper surfaces. At this point, the friction is greater than the pulling force. Similarly, in a fault, the friction between the two sides stops the fault from, from moving. This is the equivalent of the fault surfaces being locked in the real world. As movement continues to deform the elastic band, stretching it, elastic energy is stored. Similarly, in a fault system, the material around the fault deforms as movement occurs, storing elastic energy. Eventually, enough elastic energy is stored, is accumulated, to cause the block to move. At this point, the pulling force is greater than the frictional force holding it in place. Similarly, in a fault system, enough elastic energy is eventually stored to overcome the frictional force, and then we have an earthquake, where energy is released in the form of the crushing of rocks, heat, and seismic waves and the propagation of seismic waves. It needs to be pointed out though that not all of the, en the elastic energy is lost from the rubber band after, it's, after the block slips. We can see this because it's still taut. Similarly, not all of the energy is lost from the material around the fault after an earthquake. These can lead to several aftershocks, although these are often smaller than the initial earthquake. Now, let's return to the question, can earthquakes be predicted? Take a few minutes now to repeat the activity. This time, however, Use a data sheet like this one to record your observations of how far the block moves each time. Use a measuring tape like this or a long ruler to measure the length of each jump. Make sure everything else in the setup remains the same, especially the pulling motion. Make sure that it's smooth and steady each time. Once your data sheet is complete, take a look at your observations. Is there any predictable behaviour? Are there any patterns in the length of the jumps? Take a few minutes to do this now and we'll return shortly. Welcome back. 
How did you get on? So you may have found it difficult to predict the movement of your block. Why is that? Well, the reason that it's difficult to predict when and how far the block moves is because of the irregularity of the two sandpaper surfaces. This is the exact reason that it's difficult to predict when, where and how big an actual earthquake will be because of the irregularity of the fault surfaces. So to answer the question of whether earthquakes can be predicted, it's a clear no. But that's not quite the end of the story. So although scientists can't predict the exact location and timings of an earthquake, they can still say a lot about where and when they may be. They can do this by taking measurements related to the fault. Let's have a look at our system. What measurements can we take here? So we can measure the pull of the string, we can measure the length of each jump, as we have just done, and we can also quantify the stretch of the elastic band. Scientists use a variety of different techniques to take direct and indirect measurements in order to understand fault behaviour better. So to summarise, movements in the Earth's crust cause stress to build up at fault lines and surrounding the surrounding material that forms. Energy is stored elastically, like the rubber band in our model. When the stress exceeds the frictional force that holds the two surfaces together, the fault slips and most of the energy is released in the form of seismic waves. When these waves reach the surface, they can shake things up a little bit, and that's when we know there's been an earthquake. Just a couple of thoughts to leave you with, though. As we discussed earlier, there are both advantages and disadvantages to model. Can you think of some of the, model, uh, the limitations to our model? An example may be, the fault plane is horizontal, and this is unlike any fault plane in existence. See if you can think of some other ones. Also, as you've observed, it's difficult to predict earthquakes. It's therefore necessary that we're always prepared for them. Take a few minutes now to discuss with your classmates and your teacher things that you can and should do to be prepared for earthquakes. I hope you enjoyed the lesson and now know why and how earthquakes occur. Thank you and goodbye. Hi, my name is Lewis Mitchell and I'm a student at the University of Leeds at School of Earth and Environment here in the UK. Thank you for considering this lesson. The lesson should take approximately one hour with 20 minutes of video time and 40 minutes of class discussion and activities, providing that the basic materials have been collected and prepared prior to the day of the lesson. The objectives of the lesson are to develop an understanding of faults and how the surfaces of faults interact, to explain the process of an earthquake using the elastic rebound theory and to explore the benefits and limitations of using models to represent a more complex system. To achieve these objectives, it's clear that our students have an understanding of these key concepts prior to the start of the lesson. The Earth's interior structure, plate tectonics, the properties of earth, Earth's materials, especially the elasticity of some materials, and fault motions. You can check out our other videos for more information on these topics. The materials you'll need for the lesson are a tape measure, a piece of string, an elastic band, two wood blocks, two eye screws and a piece of sandpaper, a sanding belt of a different grit size to the sandpaper and one or more printouts of the data sheet to record observations and finally printouts of the map showing the distribution of, of uh, earthquakes globally. These materials can be obtained anywhere in the world, almost anywhere in the world and for more information on the specifics of the materials such as the dimensions of the blocks and the printouts see the resource pages for this video. You can choose to gather materials for one setup and use it in front of the class, or can create several and have the students split into smaller groups in order to operate it, them operate it themselves. It's important that you assemble some of, the, some of the materials prior to the class, such as screwing in the wooden blocks and gluing the sandpaper to the bottom. We also encourage you to involve the students in the setup of the model. This enables them to be more engaged with the model itself. Please try the model a few times prior to the lesson yourself so you're familiar with how it behaves. Also, make sure that the rubber band isn't too stiff. If it is, it won't show the accumulation of elastic energy. Finally, also make sure that the, the grip size of your sandpaper and sanding block aren't too rough. If they are, the block may move, not move at all. Allow plenty of time for students to discuss how their model relates to an actual fault system and add questions as you see fit. Also allow students time to discuss the advantages and disadvantages of using a model to represent a more complex system. I hope you enjoyed the lesson and thank you.